on a general set of principles that you can use in applying not just to the ballot issues on Tuesday when you go to vote, but to the agendas of certain political candidates when you go to make that decision, and to other issues going forward in the future. So what I want to give you is a set of 10 principles, kind of a top 10 list of things to consider when you're determining how to engage in your civic duty. So uh, first of all, let's remember what we're in this game for. We're in this for progress. We want to move the ball in a certain direction. C.S. Lewis defined progress as moving closer to the place that it is that you want to be. So the first thing we have to do is imagine a place that we want to be and then try to advance closer to that place. And this gets us to our first principle, and it is one of self-ownership. Uh, I founded the 1851 Center to use constitutional law and legal action to move us closer to a place of self-ownership. Um, that is the principle that you own you. It's actually very simple. Who else could own you? You're born into this world with your mind, your hands, and your time, and that's really all that you have. And every second of that life of yours is precious. Every beat of your heart is precious. And any government action that interferes with that little time that you have, that expropriates the fruit of your labor, uh, should, should be only for exigent circumstances. Because you own you, and you own the products of your labor. So you, you go out into the world and you apply your faculties, your time, your hands, and your mind to certain projects, and you create things, and those things are yours. Those things, in fact, are you. And, and this is essential, essential to your humanity. And it's important that government not treat us as cattle that are there to produce meat you know, in the form of tax revenue so they can carry on their pet projects or treat us as you know, chickens that lay the golden egg that is then redistributed to uh, certain politically favored groups or special interests. <laughs> the corollary to this principle is my second principle, and that is that government exists to secure rights rather than to jeopardize them or to redistribute amenities. This principle emanates from the very founding of our country. Our country is founded upon Lockean principles. This is the notion of a social contract, the idea that we entered into a government in order to secure our rights, rather, again, to have them jeopardized. And that's the purpose of government. Uh, Jefferson said it well in the Declaration of Independence. The purpose of government is to protect life, protect your liberty, and protect your property and allow you to pursue happiness. It's So we have this document that stems from this, a constitution, a social contract between the people on the one hand and the government on the other. And so there can be no mistake about what your government is permitted to do to you, this constitution is in writing. And it creates spheres of property rights, it creates spheres whereby you can speak freely, your contracts can endure, you can trade freely, and yet we find that these principles are always in jeopardy. Which brings me to the third principle, and that is that written constitutions can and should be amended only by the amendment process in those constitutions. We live in a world where judges use terms and politicians use terms like remolding rights and reasonable regulation of rights or reasonable exercise of the police power over your private rights. Presumptions are sometimes levied in favor of government control instead of in favor of liberty. But this is not the design of our forefathers, which was a sea of liberty with islands of government power rather than the opposite, a sea of government power with only minuscule isle, islands of liberty. The progressive era started to change a lot of this, and I'll get into that when we speak uh, about the fourth principle and the fifth principle. The fourth, do not look at each matter situationally. And I cannot stress this enough, when in the year 2000, I remember distinctly watching the Republican uh, debate 
debates and the primaries, and uh, each Republican candidate for president was asked to name their favorite political philosopher. And uh, when it got to George Bush, he, he couldn't name one, so he said Jesus Christ, kind of his go-to answer. And I knew that we were in trouble there because this was an individual without a core set of principles, without a political philosophy that he could shield himself with when he went to the wolves in D.C. And you have to have these principles. When you look at each matter situationally and you engage in cost-benefit analysis, it's easy to rationalize things like government-forced health care or seemingly unlimited pay for government union employees or any number of, of other seemingly beneficent sounding policies. So it's important that you look at the incremental effect of each policy and then add it all up. You know, sometimes it makes sense for you to buy a, a new rug for your home. But it doesn't make sense if you're broke. So you have to look at the fact that you're broke when taking into account whether you really need that rug, irrespective of the actual need. So principle four, don't look at matters situationally or in isolation, but look at the overall burden of a particular set of policies or a particular worldview that is represented by those individual policies. Principle five. There is no such thing as conflicting rights. There is no right to a fair wage. There is no such thing as collective bargaining rights when those rights come from government rather than from the marketplace. There is no such thing as a, a right, for example, to a smoke-free environment on the private property of another person. And yet, all too often you hear about the conflict of rights. Well, I have a right to do this, and you have a right to do this, and those rights conflict. Realize, in a state of uh, freedom and limited government, there is never a conflicting right. Principle six, and this is an important one here in Ohio. Behind every Baptist, there is a bootlegger. <laughs> and what do I mean by this? Well, if you go back to alcohol prohibition, um, there were two people that wanted and benefited from the prohibition of alcohol. On the one hand was the Baptist, the individual who actually wanted to ban alcohol because of its uh, purportedly evil effects. And then on the other was the bootlegger, guys like Al Capone, who could make a heck of a lot more money running the alcohol business once it was illegitimate. So you have this coalition of the Baptist and the bootlegger, and this is the parable. And you see it over and over again in Ohio with all kinds of regulations. You, you have the Baptists out front who actually believe in the cause, stating this or that is for the children, or it's for the public good, it's for the public welfare, it's for fair wages for Ohioans, or it's for healthy Ohioans, or it's to protect our seniors. You hear all of these Baptist justifications for these nefarious laws that are equally perpetrated by bootleggers. You know, behind every For the Children movement, there's a teacher's union looking to enrich its members. Behind the smoking ban wasn't just people that didn't want smoking in bars, it was Johnson & Johnson making smoking cessation devices. Behind every licensing law is an occupation who is intent on keeping people out of that industry. So when they say they're protecting the public or protecting uh, the health or welfare, oftentimes they're trying to enrich themselves. I, I ask you, every time you hear the term public health, public welfare, public safety, peel back that initial layer, that initial justification for conduct, and look instead to who has a self-interest in that regulation. And you almost always find that the regulation is being used for a competitive advantage or for expropriation of taxpayers' funds out of your pockets and into theirs. So there's almost always a bootlegger. Keep your eye out for it and you'll do yourself well. Issue seven, or principle seven, be aware of the quote, public interests, the public good, public health, public welfare, etc. These terms are very interesting and you hear them almost all the time in Ohio today. And I think that you're all sufficiently educated enough not to be deceived by them, but lest you be, always remember that the public includes everyone in the public. It includes you, it includes I, and everyone else. And when our rights are trampled for the public good, well, that's just our rights being trampled for the betterment of some other people over here. We're not the public, they're not the public. 
What we've come to in Ohio is a state whereby the public good or the public health or the public welfare is defined by some particular politician of the day. And that's really his view or her view of what's in the public interest or in the public good. So be very wary of this because they have no moral high ground to determine what's in the public good. You know, uh, Justice Sutherland on the United States Supreme Court during the Depression era famously stated that uh, if you're really interested in the public good, what you allow is the maximum individual rights possible because the public consists of individuals. And the more rights and freedoms they have, the better off the public good actually is. And I think that's very much true. And these principles emanate from political philosophies that are also all around us in Ohio today. The principles of collectivism, that uh, the society comes first and us as individuals come second. Uh, and the idea of paternalism, the notion that you can't make decisions for We've yourself. Seen that through the estate tax that we are fortunate enough to eliminate this year. We've seen it through forced health care. It is the notion that government is the great gardener and that you're simply plants, flowers in the garden that won't grow unless you're gardened and weeded and trained up towards the sun by the gardener. The problem is that you're not inert matter, you're human beings. You have your own thoughts, your own methods of action, and you know what's best for you. This isn't the society that we want to live in. Instead, we want to live in a society that is the opposite, that respects the dignity of the individual, first and foremost and leaves family second, local community third, perhaps state and federal government as a distant fourth and fifth. My eighth principle that I want to leave you with is that nice sounding laws often have breathtaking consequences. And again, a lot of these you'll notice there's a common theme among some of the principles that I'm, um, that I'm articulating. And, and that is that the language is sometimes the issue here. There's a lot of trickery that goes on with these, these issues, whether it's politicians or whether it's uh, ballot issues that you're asked to vote upon. But beneficent sounding laws often have draconian consequences. Uh, Hayek spoke about this in The Road to Serfdom. He talks about the only way to enforce some of these seemingly innocuous regulations of the economy is to actually throw people in jail. And we see that now. To use the same examples, you know, healthcare, Aspirationally, it's a great idea that everybody should have health insurance. But the only way to enforce that aspiration as a law is to throw people in prison or fine them if they refuse. Or if they refuse to pay the, pay the fine, you then throw them in prison, right? The same with the smoking ban, an initiative. Seemed like a great idea. Aspirationally, like people shouldn't smoke in public or indoors. Um, but do we really want to close down Ohio's businesses and seize their assets when people do those things? And we could find one example after another of, of this notion that the only way to enforce some of these aspirational laws are through really draconian consequences. The ninth principle I want to leave you with is that voting is not the only path to limited government. And in fact, it may not even be the most effective path. And what the heck am I talking about? We're two days away from uh, going to the polls, right? So when I, say, uh, when I say that, here's what I mean. Too many of us, too many of you perhaps even, simply feel as though we've discharged our civic duty once we vote. Well, more than anything, I cannot stress enough that that is false. Voting alone is not going to change the state, it's not going to change the country, uh, it, it's not going to change anything. You know, you need to do more than simply vote. Show up, vote, and go home. You need to ask yourself, what is it that you care about? What is progress for you? And what role can you play with your knowledge, skills, and abilities in moving us closer towards that world that you want to see? And, and then I ask that you go into action and actually engage in these things instead of simply voting, going home, and perhaps yelling at your TV again for another year until the next election. Because that is not enough anymore. Um, you know, we've tried voting for this side, we try voting for that side, sometimes we try for the middle or something fringe, and we see that things often don't change. Now good candidates come along once in a while and they're worth supporting, but I ask that you go above and beyond that when you consider 
the engagement, uh, the engagement for effectuating freedom. And finally, principle 10 that I want to leave you with is that a tireless minority does have the power to effectuate liberty. And this is Sam Adams' principle, that all that you need is a tireless mi minority setting brush fires in people's minds. We don't need the majority in order to accomplish things. We didn't need the majority to get the health care freedom amendment on the ballot. We didn't have the majority when we eliminated the estate tax. We're not going to have the majority ever in Ohio. Let me say that again. We're not going to have the majority with us ever in Ohio. That means that each of you needs to be that much more tireless. You know, the American Revolution was pretty much split. A third of the people were indifferent. A third were Tories who were getting paid off by the English government and so didn't want to shake the system up. And, and only the remaining third actually wanted liberty and freedom from the tyranny that they were experiencing. And yet they were able to accomplish that. That's what a tireless minority can do, is completely turn not just a local government or a state government, but an entire nation around. So think about how you can do this. And there are tools you can use. The Ohio Constitution provides you with a multiplicity of tools with which to do this. And the entire reason that we're able to vote on vote health care on Tuesday is because of one of these tools, the initiative. And I ask that you all really strongly consider when going above and beyond and discharging your duty beyond voting to consider using the initiative, gathering signatures, putting things on the ballot, whether it's tax repeal levies in your local communities or the next big statewide ballot issue. And I believe somebody is here with those petitions tonight. So if so, make sure you sign them. But, you know, for all too long, we've been solely basing our, our ability to effectuate liberty on politicians and they have consistently let us down, which of course is the part of the part of why you're all here tonight. Um, but this tool of the initiative is very important. It creates uh, a synergy whereby you're not children begging your parents for that toy in the toy store. You all think back to when you were five years old and didn't have any money, and if you really wanted something, you had to beg your parents for it. And then you became adults, you know, you put away your childish things, you earned your own money, and you became able to buy those things on your own. Well, the initiative gives you your own political currency. It makes you civic adults. You don't have to beg the politicians to pass a law that you want to see passed. You don't have to beg them to stop that law. You are able to directly engage in the system and effectuate liberty on your own. And I ask that you support that tool and use that going forward in Ohio, because in order to correct this state, we're going to have to. We started it with the estate tax, we hit health care, next year we're hitting right to work, and we're going to change the state even more with the Taxpayer Bill of Rights and Education Tax Credits in the coming five years. So I ask that you all work hard to try to support those things as well. And I know that you all already have worked hard, so thank you for what you've done, thank you for what you're doing now, and will do in the coming days, and thank you all for what you're going to do going forward to make all of our lives better again. Thanks for your time tonight.